Good morning, everybody. I'm Shay Coakley. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Leanbox. Really excited to be here with everybody this morning. I think this is a super interesting topic. As soon as I was asked to uh, moderate this panel, I just thought this was going to be a really great discussion. Um, so just a quick background on myself, and then we're going to do the same for all the panelists. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm the co-founder of um, Leanbox, as well as another uh, couple uh, early to mid-stage startups all of which actually do not have a <clears throat> standard HR team. Um, before that, I worked for mid to later stage startups that had a, a variation on um, people operations and human resources teams. And uh, I'm really excited to talk about the, the gifts and curses of running uh, a startup without an HR team, um, defining when uh, is the appropriate time to hire a full-time HR team and all the other things that we'll get into uh, fairly soon. So um, without further ado, I'll kick it over to uh, do a little bio on our first uh, panelist. Uh, Tracy, I'm going to kick it over to you first. Okay. Hi, everyone. I uh, appreciate you having me today. Uh, I'm Tracy Tsvoka. I'm the office manager at Hopper. Uh, Hopper is a travel app specializing in price predictions on flights, and we also offer hotel and car rental bookings as well. Um, I've been with Hopper for roughly four years, and I've done a little bit of everything uh, under the operations um, umbrella. So, um, so I definitely <laughs> have dabbled in a lot of things. Um, Previous to Hopper, uh, I was with um, a company called MailChimp, which is an Atlanta-based email marketing service. Uh, there I spent six years with their compliance team, and uh, I had the opportunity to help work through some growing pains there, but also quickly scale and grow their team as well. But uh, I appreciate you guys having me. I'm really excited. Thanks, Tracy. And uh, Christina, we'll go to you next. Thank you, Shay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Costa. I am head of learning and development at Outco. So Outco is a startup that offers job seeking engineers, technical and interview and communications training. So during the whole technical interview process, um, many of you might not know, but that's a really, really complicated, very uh, difficult interview process. And so we actually help train engineers through that process and help them secure some of the best jobs at the fame companies out there, you know, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Googles. Um, so I've been there for about a year now. Actually, in October, it'll be a year, which is kind of crazy. Time flies. And I have held a variety of different roles. I actually started off as a career coach. Then I went on to lead the career program. Then I got brought on full time and now I'm head of learning and development. So that's kind of how it is in the startup world. You can wear many hats. Um, previously to Outco, I have worked at many different tech companies, uh, large and small. I've worked at places like HubSpot and PayPal, which had a very defined HR uh, department. But then I've worked at very small startups like LendBuzz and Duet, uh, an education tech startup and a financial tech startup that were only, one of them was only 12 people. Uh, and the other one was about 20 employees. So I've kind of seen the whole gamut of what it's like to have an HR team and not. So I'm happy to share my experiences with you all. Thanks so much, Christina. Uh, I see you. I'm going to go to you next. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Super excited to be here. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know me, um, my name is Afia C. Thomas, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Build Brand Design. And pretty much we are an upscale, premium, full service uh, creative agency that helps entrepreneurs build brand and design uh, their companies. Uh, I'm super excited about this topic because prior to running my company, Build Brand Design, uh, full time. I was actually a, a Harvard HR professional. Uh, and so we had a very, very detailed uh, run of things and how we did things as well. So I've been able to see both sides of it. Uh, very much like Christina explained, I actually started out as a career coach myself. Uh, and just found that I wanted to be able to help people actually navigate their ways and define um, their entrepreneurship or professional lanes, whatever that might look like, uh, and be able to build companies that they love and are in love with. Uh, so that's a little bit about my background. Excited to be here, excited to be talking about two topics that I love. We know that the entrepreneur and startup space is not, um, entrepreneur space, excuse me, is not an easy place to be. So happy to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much. 
Thanks so much, Avia. And uh, Pooja, we'll go over to you now. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. I'm Pooja Samuel. I'm the People Operations Lead at Mabel. Um, Mabel is a company or a startup, excuse me, that um, is working on uh, software automation. So we help make your uh, auto, uh, your website testing, excuse me, uh, more efficient and easy to do. Um, I've been with Mabel for a year and a half. Uh, before that, I worked as the office manager at Love Pop. Um, Love Pop really is what helped me push my passion towards people operations. And I've gotten the opportunity to, similar to Christina and Afia, wear several hats at Mabel. Um, and it's a lot of fun. I think startups are exciting for that reason. You get to kind of touch every part of the company and that's really fun to do. Um, I'm excited to, to talk about this uh, topic that I'm really passionate about and share what I've learned with all of you. Thanks so much, Pooja. So we're, we're gonna jump right into the questions now. And I think, uh, I mean, a pretty good place to start is just by asking, I mean, HR and people operations are our core function. So I guess the first question I would have is, what would be the reasons for running a company without an HR team? Um, so uh, Christine, I'm gonna kick it over to you first. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, talk high level first. Yeah, so the reasons for running a company without HR is usually not by choice. <laughs> it's usually because they don't have the funding or the budget to hire an HR team. Um, so I know for me, at least in, in my one of my first roles, um, working at a startup, again, called LendBuzz, um, and it's a financial tech startup. And essentially, when I joined, I was actually their 12th employee. So they had only been around for about two years. Um, and then they really started ramping up hiring. So I was actually hired as a digital marketing manager on the team um, and helping really with all of their marketing efforts. So, you know, when I was, when I joined, it was a lot of just learning on the spot. Like, this is what we need. Th these are the, you know, parts of the business that we need you to focus on and we need you to just go. Um, so I remember we did have one person on the team. Her name's Sammy. Shout out to Sammy. I don't know if she's here. Um, and she kind of ran everything HR. Uh, but technically she wasn't an HR employee. So, uh, so really ultimately it's generally due to lack of budget um, and not having, you know, the, the resources at the time to hire an HR team. At least that's been my, my experience and a few of the different companies that I've worked at. Um, at Outco, just shout out to Outco. We actually hit our five year anniversary last month and we actually do have a People Matters Higher now. So we actually have someone who's in charge of People Matter. And let me tell you, it has been an experience, a really positive experience to have someone who is an HR professional join the team and really help with feedback loops, really help with um, setting up systems for hiring and setting up trainings. Just it, it's so important. But in my past experience, it's been generally due to lack of budget, not because of need. I don't know if other people agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Christina, I think that's that's an interesting point. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I, I know my first entrepreneurial venture ever started with four people in basically a closet. So, you know, at those stages, you're not hiring a full time HR manager. So I totally agree. Uh, a lot of time it's just purely budget. And I think what you mentioned earlier too, everybody wearing all sorts of different hats. Um, anybody else on the panel have any um, broad picture reasons why you might not hire an HR uh, manager or people ops manager early on. I agree with Christina. What? Oh, good. Good. I feel. Um, I agree with Christina. I think it's definitely a lot of times a budget thing um, or lack of budget. In addition to that, I think sometimes startups don't understand uh, the importance of an HR team uh, and how that actually affects the entire company. So we think about marketing. We think about all the other things that pretty much bring um, revenue into the business, but HR has the function even when we look at bringing in the right talent, right? And how that affects our bottom line. Um, so I would say lack of budget and also not knowing the importance of an HR team is also um, reasons why, why that happens. I'd be curious if any of you guys um, uh, feel this a little bit. I mean, I, in talking with people before the panel, some of the HR functions early on in a company, I received feedback, and this certainly applies to myself as well. Um, you would think not having an HR manager would be because of uh, putting a lack of importance on that, but sometimes it's actually the exact opposite. So I talked to founders that said, 
the functions that they felt an HR manager would take early on were so important to them that they wanted to do them themselves. Like I see you mentioned uh, recruiting um, as an early stage startup. I mean, oftentimes founders and um, executives in early stage startups want to be involved in that. So has that been part of your experience as well, that some of these you are not yet ready to relinquish those kind of things to uh, another employee? Um, so for me, I have, <laughs> I have the HR background, uh, so that's, I guess, a, a good spot to be in. Um, I would say, though, for entrepreneurs that I work with, um, when we have an HR conversation or training conversation, I'm not always seeing that that is the case. I do see what I mentioned a little bit earlier, where it's not there's not much of an understanding of how much that's important, especially if they're a solopreneur um, and they're at the beginning stage is really focused on um, getting revenue into the business and sales and marketing. That's the leading things that I see. Now for entrepreneurs who are pretty much at the place where they say they want to be a part of the process, I would challenge that and say, okay, fine, be a part of the process. Um, but as we like to say, stay in your lane, right? And so bring in someone. There are a lot of uh, resources as well. Bumble, I think, is one of them uh, companies that have um, HR solutions that are kind of like third party that can come in and support you. So definitely be a part of the process, but trust the experts and trust the process for being able to say, hey, this is your expertise. Help me out as a, as a startup or as an entrepreneur um, is what I would say to that. Yeah, perfect. So, I mean, given given that, I guess, what are some of the challenges that you guys have faced in, in running a company without an HR function? Um, I'm going to start with you, Pooja, on that. Sure. Thanks, Shay. So um, I think there are several challenges that come up when you're running an HR function um, solo. Um, for me, I would say the biggest challenges I've come up against have been um, first building structure that benefits all of our employees. Um, you know, all of our employees are on different journeys in their career path. And so it's important to not give, you know, them a one size fits all solution. So, you know, job leveling should be specific, performance management, diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives, career development, all of those things and being cognizant of where folks are in their lives, um, you know, professionally and personally and making sure that we're creating, you know, a foundational structure that really benefits everyone. Um, and then I think two is creating trust um, in employees that HR is not that sort of old school, you know, function that is just there to protect the company. Um, you know, that we want to really uplift and protect our employees as well. And so changing that reputation, I think, really revolves around creating programs and policies that um, are employee centric, you know, and making sure that we are um, available to employees to talk about more than just, you know, those sort of old antiquated um, policies that used to be in place and that made HR like a scary, you know, uh, group to go to. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to hear mm -hmm. if anybody else has has challenges that they've come across. Yeah, Pooja, that's great. I just I just wanted to point out one thing that you said that I think is, is super critical and I'm sure we'll loop back around to in the rest of the conversation, but that idea of the changing form of what HR is all about, um, having yeah. previously been there to protect the company, and then this sort of mold into uh, a people ops HR function that is there to, to help employees create culture, create diversity, create programs for learning. Um, I, I think that shift is, is really important and, and it's really, I think escalated in the last 10 years in a really positive way. So I, I'm sure we'll loop back around to that, but I think that was a really important point. Um, Christina, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so for so for us, at least at, at Outco, one of the challenges has been, especially moving into a 100% remote space, right? I think a, a big challenge has been creating culture, right? And really creating a, a space of inclusivity where people can show up as their authentic selves to work. Um, we really, really highly value diversity um, at Outco. If you look at our executive leadership team, it's probably the most exec, uh, diverse executive leadership team I've ever seen, at least. Uh, and I've worked many places. So <laughs> I think for us, um, really trying to create a culture where any free employee can feel included, where every employee, you know, say they have their, their role, whether that's working on marketing or working on sales, but if they want to be involved in other parts of the business, we want to keep that open for them, right? So not only 
creating a culture of inclusivity where everyone can be themselves, but also a culture of iteration right? and a culture of if you do want to try another project or if you do have a suggestion on how to better market something or if you do maybe have a suggestion on our product or our program that we're offering that you feel open to have that conversation with your manager or with your teammates and kind of what is the due process from there, right? So it's not just you giving, you know, suggestions, but how are we actually going to implement these, right? So that everybody feels included and part of the process. So I think that's been something that has been a little bit of a challenge just because, you know, everyone's in different time zones. Outco is actually, the headquarters is in San Francisco. Um, so most of my colleagues are actually on the West Coast. Um, but then we have career coaches that are all around the country. So I have coaches who are in Texas. I have coaches who are in Massachusetts and New York. Um, so it's also kind of just creating this, this space where everyone can, can feel like a family, but in a remote way. Um, so we have created Slack channels, like very specific Slack channels for different topics. Um, we do a lot of partnerships work with nonprofit organizations that we really feel passionate about. Um, we really wanted to do something around Black Lives Matters. So we actually decided to do a fundraiser, right? And everybody got to vote on it. Um, so really just making everything much more collaborative purposefully um, has been a challenge, but also has been a great, uh, I think, feat for us as well. That's awesome. I, and I'm glad, I mean, that sort of um, piggybacks on some of what Pooja was saying that, you know, the HR function being more culture driven and less block and tackle administrative, which I think is, uh, my guess is going to be a, a common theme of this, this discussion. Um, I see, I think you have some thoughts on that, that question as well. As far as the challenges that um, I think I've seen is definitely the remote um, remote option right now. I see that that's coming up um, and managing your team from afar. Um, I think it's a new model. We were pushed into it. Uh, and so that's one of the key pieces. The other thing is that we're also in a climate where um, there are a lot of diversity um, conversations that are happening and having to navigate that while in a remote space, um, update the way that we do things, company culture, um, so definitely echoing a lot of things that Christina said as well. Um, managers are also worried about accountability, right? How do I manage my team? How do I um, uh, look at productivity uh, and kind of like measure uh, performance as well? So those are the kind of the challenges that are coming up. But I would say culture, accountability um, at, those, at this point is, is kind of the top things that, that I would say are our challenge right now. Awesome. Appreciate that idea. Um, so Tracy, I'm going to go over to you for, for this next question. I think the, the natural question next becomes um, sort of at what stage does a full-time HR or people operations uh, person come in? And this is obviously going to be different for every company, but when you think about that, is there a specific revenue number, for example, that drives that? Uh, what are your thoughts on when the appropriate timing is um, as you mentioned, um, it's obviously going to depend on, on the company and what stages that they're at. Um, just from my personal experience of having to handle a lot of um, different functions within the people ops realm, for me, it feels like it's more about um, your personal bandwidth. So I feel like it's driven by you. Um, and the reason why I say this is I think it's really easy to um, get um, I think it's really easy to um, think about how you have to have everything running smoothly and how you have to get all these different tasks done. And um, it gets to the point where you don't realize you're running yourself into the ground. <laughs> and uh, because as a people ops person, everyone else is coming first. So um, burnout is very common in the startup world. And I think it's very important that people are aware of it and are able to identify it. Um, so, uh, you know, a way that might be helpful is just keeping a running list of tasks and responsibilities that fall under the people ops world. Um, so this way you could kind of reflect, see what you can contract out, see what you can automate and um, just to kind of free up your time. But obviously, if you've done all of those things and you still don't have the time to put into your 
daily responsibilities, I feel like that comes to a point where you need to make that higher and you really need to drive that decision. Um, and just having those lists of responsibilities, um, it'll help you out when it's time to make that hire and you need to create a job description. Or even if you need to go to your leadership team and say like, hey, I need help. This is everything that I'm handling. And, um, and I think it's time to have another person come on board. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, that I think um, not a lot of people understand all the functions of what people ops do. So having that list, I think, will help you um, just really advocate for yourself to get another person in uh, when it comes to leadership. Yeah, that, that makes sense, Tracy. I mean, I feel like you're talking to this idea that I think startup founders and executives often have, which is, you know, are you working in the business or are you working on the business? Um, and one of the things that that stuck out to me was just, you know, simply the amount of time that you're putting into human resources and people operations and whether or not that time is being effective. I mean, I'll, I'll say one of the things that I've done for myself and for my employees when we're thinking about the idea of hiring uh, a new employee or creating a new role, actually, I should say, is trying to more uh, definitively quantify how much time is being spent on that or how much time should be spent on that. So um, <clears throat> if we have someone in um, that's overlapping with human resources functions and we're thinking about hiring a full-time HR role, oftentimes what I'll have that person do is actually even just set a clock to the amount of time in a given week they're spending on that. Um, and then filling the rest of that out with the amount of time they should be spending on that to see if a full-time role makes sense. Um, what about you, Ifea, on that uh, timing-wise, um, revenue-wise, when to transition this role over to full-time? What are your thoughts? Well, I realize that, um, so similar to what Tracy said, that there, every company is different uh, and everything, so every company is different and it, it looks different. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are options that you have. I think there's a company, again, that offers uh, very simple HR functions for about $99 a month or, or so forth. So as soon as you're able to bring in some, um, some level of HR, the better. Um, I'll go down to a very, very basic problem um, that I found even within my company. I like to be very transparent um, so that I'm most helpful. So being a former HR professional um, and then also being an entrepreneur, one of the mistakes that I made um, that cost me some time was not having a clear job description when I brought on my first person. It was very, um, very simple, but it was something that caused an issue. So I found that um, with this first employee that I was spending a lot of time like going over like at least two, three weeks of going over and defining what I wanted, what it looked like, and that was ultimately a waste of time in my business, right? So that's to answer the first question of how soon should you bring in HR? As soon as possible, even as you're mapping out the business, what are the things and key functions that I will need and key roles that I will need within my business in order for it to run effectively and efficiently? That's number one. And then as far as when you're able to bring someone on full time, that depends on the numbers, right? But I would encourage you to look at the numbers. Um, <laughs> know that there are certain HR functions that you can start before you are able to bring someone on full time. And when you're able to financially, do it as soon as possible. That's great. And I, you know, I feel like you jumped on a topic that I think is pretty critical to human resources and people operations, even if it's done by the executive or the founder or not a full-time employee is this, this sort of feedback loop. I think you, you touched on a little bit. I think a lot of, you know, in big fortune 500 companies, you have this very particular set of work often that you do and you know, if you're doing a good job, I think in a startup, at least from my experience, it's a little more challenging. You're sort of creating a uh, new territory and one of the things that I've often uh, had a difficult time balancing, quite frankly, is, you know, uh, micromanaging versus completely letting be, right? And um, one thing that it took me quite a while to learn, honestly, is um, that employees want feedback on how they're doing, and they want feedback negative or positive. Um, and that's, that's something that, that I had to learn in this world is that 
Um, even if they're not doing well at a particular task or not spending enough time on a, a particular task, um, I think that they, they want to hear about that. They'd rather hear negative than hear silence because uh, they want to know how they can improve. So I think that that idea you touched on job description and what's successful in that particular job. And I think that's hugely important, particularly at a startup where the target is kind of always shifting around. Um, so, you know, unlike a traditional company where you might have a job description that's going to be around for three, four, five years or more, um, that job description might change every six months just because the startup changes that often. So I, I think that's a really, really good point. Um, that makes a lot of sense. So there was a question that came up on the chat and was something is perfect timing. And I feel you, you actually mentioned this, and I think it's perfect timing to go into this. And it's sort of this idea of like, how do you fill the gaps with, with third parties? So um, there's a lot of different resources companies have and startups have like benefits brokers, consultants, online resources, things that you can do to sort of bridge that gap before you move over to a full-time HR person. I'd love to hear the panel's um, thoughts on what they've used, what's been successful, basically what, what third party either uh, people or resources have you used? I'm going to start with you, Pooja. Sure. So um, at Mabel, I am a one woman show, um, which is fun, but also challenging. <laughs> um, so I've been fortunate to partner with um, a benefits broker, which is super helpful when open enrollment comes around. Um, you know, open enrollment is an annual thing, but Mabel really um, being, you know, employee centric, it's important for us to really reevaluate those benefits and those perks that come along every year. And so having a benefits broker as like a sounding board is, is really clutch. It's, you know, a wonderful um, thing for me to have. Um, we also work with an HR consultant. So I'm, you know, fairly new in my HR uh, journey. And so it's nice to have someone um, there to talk about regulations. Uh, we do have some out of state employees as well. So learning those laws, but having somebody who's already knowledgeable there to help back me up um, is awesome and amazing. Um, and she also serves as a third party, like non-biased um, human that our team can go to if they don't feel comfortable coming to me, their manager or our co-founders for any issues that they might be um, facing uh, at Mabel. And then finally, I've really um, personally benefited from having a membership to SHRM, the uh, Society for Human Resource Management. Um, incredible resource, being able to just hop on their site. And for example, I, we were looking at attrition and tracking that and just being able to hop on to SHRM's website and like get like this very in-depth, you know, comprehensive, um, you know, detail about how to think about attrition and how to build out trackers to make sure that we're staying on top of how our employees are moving um, in the company. I would love to hear if uh, anyone else has other, you know, recommendations that they've worked with. I love that you mentioned um, SHRM as well, uh, which is actually a great resource. Um, we haven't touched on the topic of, of compliance, uh, which is a huge, huge piece of HR as well. So being connected to SHRM uh, and just really looking at the company from a perspective that's not necessarily recruiting or some of the other functions, but are we simply in compliance, right? Um, so I love that you said that, Pooja. Absolutely. Yeah. To add to that, onto what Pooja just said. So I worked at a company before at a startup uh, where we actually hired an agile project manager as well. And that was just because we were a very, very small, very new project based company. It's actually called Human Side. This is a job I had. Um, it was actually a contract role for a couple of months before I, before I was full time with Outco. So um, they actually didn't really have, you know, set systems in place of how they wanted to complete projects and like we were getting a lot of complicated projects and we decided okay we need we should hire a, a third party someone who's an expert in agile project management so a lot of times you can find these experts on upwork you can find these experts you know on on third party websites um mainly i've used upwork i don't know if there's other websites that you guys would recommend um, but that's the one where i've found project managers or people who specialize in hr and different functions in hr as well so if your company is really small and maybe you don't have the budget right now to hire a consultant full-time because it is pricey it can get pricey um, you can hire someone very part-time 
right? Someone to come in and kind of offer some expertise and consulting. Another piece of software that I've used before uh, for HR functions is Monday, monday.com. Um, but there are quite a few other softwares too, like Bamboo, I know is another one. I think, Afia, you mentioned Bumble. Um, so there are, you know, companies out there that offer software specifically for HR functions. Um, again, depending on your budget, right? That's always number one in, in startup world, right? Budget, budget, budget. Do we have the money for this? <laughs> Do we have the money and we're not going to be able to, we're not going to cut anyone's payroll or anything like that, right? So that's really important. Um, but there are a lot of research. Sherm as well. I've done a lot of reading of their articles and a lot of their content is also free. Um, so that's a great resource to check out as well. Uh, but yeah, I would say there are a lot of resources out there. You just really have to make sure that it aligns with what you, with what your business needs are, right? If your business need right now is recruiting, right? Because at the end of the day, your employees and your people at your company are your biggest asset. And I think that's what a lot of people forget with HR. They just think, oh, HR is just there to kind of like make people happy. And it's like, no, HR is what helps retain your talent and keep people and develop them. And actually that's your most important asset is your talent, right? Because if you are losing people for whatever reason, it takes time and effort to re-recruit and retrain. And that's literally the biggest um, you know, loss that a company can have is if they lose someone who's, who is talent, right? Then they have to go relook, retrain, lose all of those hours of, of of work, right? So that's something that I think everybody just needs to realize it's very important to keep your employees happy and keep them feeling fulfilled and keep them feeling as though they're being invested into. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Christina, Jonathan Levine says he thinks that you keep saying Bumble, which he thinks is probably not the appropriate place to go for <laughs> HR resources. Um, so, yeah, I, I, think, I think you guys all uh, said something, I think just to pile on to this idea of using your vendors, I mean, like, or, or the, the people that are selling to you. So health insurance providers, uh, health insurance carriers, real estate brokers, um, all of these people, I mean, when you think about it, they want you to succeed. The bigger you get as an organization, the, you know, the better their revenue is going to be. And one piece of feedback that I've heard um, and someone I'd be curious to ask you guys, someone asked to specifically share some of the actual vendors you work with to give a shout out as they're moving to Massachusetts and they were looking for benefits brokers, things of that nature. But um, for example, I use Telemon um, for our uh, insurance brokerage firm and they've been extremely helpful to us. And one thing I've heard from them is they're not asked enough to provide these type of resources. Um, I'll give just an example of that. Uh, I run a convention called Perks in, in this HR world, and uh, I deal with a lot of benefits brokers in this space. And the benefits brokers actually have a dedicated uh, employee often that is in charge of consulting with their clients on health, wellness, and culture. And a lot of times companies, even though they have access to that, aren't asking for it. So. I think a lot of what you guys talked about in terms of pulling from resources, it just comes down to asking. And that can not only be from help, but even cost reduction on things like you, you mentioned SHRM or NEBIC, New England Employee Benefits Council, Worksite Wellness Council of Massachusetts. I think one thing that's important to point out to the people that are, are, are listening to this panel is more often than not, there is a startup discount that is not listed somewhere on their webpage. So, a lot of these organizations are dedicated towards larger uh, companies and they're interested in continuing to get new folks into the fold. So there's often uh, pricing and help that you can get as a startup that you might not be able to get later on to save some of that precious cost that we talked about um, earlier. Anyone else want to give someone had asked uh, about specific benefits brokers or resources? You know, you mentioned Sherm. Is there any other shout outs that you guys want to give to people that have been helpful to you? Yeah, I can certainly talk about our benefits broker. Um, we use Woodruff Sawyer um, and my account manager, Lauren, is wonderful. Um, Lauren is incredibly available. Um, so not only if I have a question, but she's also available to my employees if they have questions, um, you know, and she is just amazing and they're wonderful. She does all my math. I am terrible at math. So when <laughs> annual <laughs> enrollment comes around, Lauren does all my math. And uh, that's just really amazing to have that, you know, 
and, and like I said, it's partnering, right? Because like she's, she knows about our employees, she gets to know them, their concerns around, um, you know, health benefits and things like that. And she's really a partner um, when it comes to our benefits. So it's Woodruff Sawyer. I cannot recommend them. I'll put it into the chat as well, but I can't recommend them enough. Um, super, super helpful, very easy to get in touch with. Um, it is like working with somebody who's like right in your company. That's great. Appreciate that. Um, so this has been touched on a number of times in the conversation, but I wanted to, to dedicate uh, a specific question to this. I mean, I think we could all agree that in, you know, startup phase, hiring and keeping talent is a huge part of the game. So, um, and that, that is really an HR function. So I guess, how do you get this done without having a dedicated HR team? And I'm going to start with Tracy on this one. Uh, yeah, for, for sure. I think um, it's, it's very difficult to try to recruit and retain um, talent when it comes to the startup world. Um, I think Christina kind of touched on it about uh, providing uh, learning and development. It's just a, a lot of things. <laughs> um, but I for me, I, I've had a lot of success um, in the attracting and the retaining talent just through providing um, a great experience um, because most startups can't compete with a Google salary or a Facebook uh, benefits and perks program. My approach has always been to win them with your personality and trying to provide them uh, a unique experience. Um, we've also mentioned that uh, budget is always a thing, which kind of pushes you to have um, a creative way of creating those memorable experiences, whether it's trying to put a different twist on a regular game night or anything like that. Um, so I think uh, for sure you, you really want to go for the experience. Um, for, for candidates, you know, for me, it's my goal for them to have a great experience from the first touch point to the end touch point. So this way, even if an offer isn't extended, uh, the hope is that they are going home and telling friends like, well, you know, like I, I didn't get the job, but like it seemed like such a great place to work. And um, that word of mouth, I think is tremendous. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, you want employees to go on social media. You want them to, you know, feel the warm and fuzzies. You want them to have something to talk about and really kind of advertise on your behalf. Um, I think that it helps attract um, potential candidates, but also just it's a good gauge of um, if, if they're happy at their job. And, um, and culture is just like a small part of it. Um, I think employee experience goes way deeper than that. Um, whether it's learning and development, um, because, you know, people want continued growth. Uh, if you ha you're going to have first time managers. So making sure that they have first time management training, that's very important. Um, just so not only are you setting up your managers for success, but also the individual contributors are having a great experience as well. Um, I think there are a ton of things that touch on this topic. And so I'm going to go ahead and kind of pass it over to everyone else because I feel like this is something that everyone has like a ton of experience in. I'll, I'll yeah, add makes to that. Sense. Um, Sorry, I'll, I'll add to what Tracy said because okay. I agree with everything that, that she said. I think another thing that um, hiring managers or whoever is doing the recruitment uh, process needs to realize is at least this is what we do at Outco, right? So we train on hiring people. Like we train on job seeking, for job seeking engineers to get hired. So like interviewing and that whole process is very different at Outco. We don't do the typical interview process where you have to look at someone's background and we want to know what school you went to we want that's not that's not how we hire um, we hire based on potential and passion so we really value um, hiring employees based if their mission aligns with our mission right because at the end of the day you know you can have the phd you can have the master's degree that doesn't mean that you're going to be passionate with um, our product or the services that we offer. That doesn't mean that you're going to work above and beyond and that you have more grit than someone who really wants to be there. So I, I'm really a firm believer in challenging yourself when you're recruiting and not always looking for kind of the, the, the same thing that everyone else is looking for, which is like the master's degrees and the certifications and all of these things and don't necessarily make you a better worker. Um, I've actually found at Alco that we've hired a few people with very um, unique backgrounds um, that were not in tech 
actually. This might be their first job working in tech. And I will tell you right now, they have been the one blowing it out of the water. They have been the ones who are so passionate to be there and to learn. And they want to just kind of grasp every piece of the business. Um, and those are the employees that you want to keep. Right, because these are the employees that are not that are going to be loyal to your team and loyal to the mission. Um, and so, I, I highly recommend anyone in this in this room um, to really open open up your eyes and try to hire for talent and potential, not just pedigree. Um, because that I've seen so much turnover at companies that only look at those things, um, and that doesn't necessarily make someone a good employee. So, just one thing I want to mention. Yeah. I think that's a really good point, Christina. And I often think, you know, hiring for an early stage company is really interesting. And this harkens back to what we talked about earlier about the job description constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I've found in my years of running startups is, you know, the importance of uh, less importance, like you said, on pedigree, or they went to this specific college or they whatever. And, you know, just people that are smart, hardworking, ability to adapt, um, fits into the culture, all of that kind of stuff, that sort of intangible stuff often becomes even more important, uh, far more important, in my opinion, than, than pedigree. Uh, I, I could not agree with that. We hire for grit. We're like, you know, what do you do if you can't figure out an issue? What are you going to do? Oh, you're going to try everything possible to make it happen? Cool. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, any other uh, thoughts on that question? I think I, I feel you had some thoughts on that. Absolutely. So um, just to kind of recap the question, we're talking pretty much about, you know, within the, you know, within the recruitment process, right? Um, yeah. Just being able to, how do you get this done without a need to our team? Um, so for me, one of the things that's really, really uh, important when you're hiring, similar to what Christina said, is really just understanding that your first hires are partnerships, right? So um, it's not necessarily d the degrees and it's not necessarily all of the bells and whistles, but what are some of the things that you may actually need um, help with and that's maybe not as a founder or um, where are you struggling and where does this person shine? You want your talent to be able to shine within their own right and also be able to be an addition to the team. I think sometimes people make the mistake of saying like, hey, in order to push company culture, or in, order, in, in order to um make everything fit we're hiring people with the same personalities we're hiring people with almost kind of the same qualifications and i think that that can be very dangerous when you're looking for talent but more so saying again how does this person partner um, and identifying that there are weaknesses as founders and startups startups that we have we're not able to do everything right so again when you're hiring, identifying that, that those first hires are much more partnerships than they are just kind of adding another person um, onto the team. Yeah, I think just to to pile onto that idea, I mean, I think one of the, I think one of the common mistakes that that people make when looking for, like you said, a partner um, or an early employee, we have this natural human inclination to say like. Oh, I like this person. They're kind of like me. We got along. Uh, but one thing that I would just point out is like what you really want early on are people that are very much not like you. <laughs> you know, um, you need to round out your skill set. You need to have different opinions. Um, so I find that you, you need to fight that inclination in the interview process to say, oh, like I'm getting along with this person. We're very much alike. And it's it's far more important to get someone that is is quite different than you, especially early on. Um, to get that right sort of soup of, uh, of startup uh, that works together. Um, someone had, had pointed out um, that some of the stuff we've mentioned that is very specific and actionable uh, as being helpful. And I just thought of this and put it into the chat um, on this recruiting and retention thing. There's been a tool that I've used for quite a while now called Recruitee um, with two E's at the end. Um, just something for people to look into. Um, I have no equity in this company. I just happen to really like it. Um, and it's basically a, a very simple talent acquisition, acquisition management tool that we've used from the start. And it's excellent um, at tracking candidates, finding them, keeping it all in one place. So just something, yeah, someone just put it in. That's great. Thank you. Um, so 
you know, obviously there are benefits to having a defined HR team down the line for a larger company, but what would be some of the benefits that you guys would perceive when, when you're talking to a candidate and, and describing what it's going to be like to work in the culture? What are some of the benefits of working for a company that doesn't have a defined HR team, that smaller stage? And I'm going to start with you on that one, Pooja. Sure. Yeah. So the biggest benefit for me um, is the ability to build something, right? Um, you're coming into a small company, you're able to put your stamp on, um, on the culture or, you know, programs, uh, policies, things like that. And so it's always exciting to build something um, kind of from the ground up. And so that's, that's the biggest, you know, uh, benefit to me. And I think the second thing is, um, is building those relationships with my employees. Um, I think it's really, really important as we talk about, you know, moving HR into, you know, our current year and into 2020 and, and kind of moving it forward, I think is just building those relationships with your employees and building that trust, um, you know, and I think that the level of camaraderie you get at a startup is really magical um, because you're all going through like similar challenges and similar growth pains. And I think that really strengthens the bonds that you create with your team and your, um, you know, your stakeholders and all of that kind of stuff. So it's just, uh, yeah, there's something magical about like building from, you know, the foundation up. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. What about you, Christine, on that one? I agree. Um, fully with Pooja, I think, you know, the, uh, I know for my, for my, in my experience, when I went to a startup, for example, I went from HubSpot, which had a thousand people, a very defined HR system, a lot of like red tape bureaucracy to LenBuzz, which was 12, a 12 person startup. So that was like a huge shift for me. Um, and I remember at LenBuzz, what got me the most excited was that I was able to be part of that. Yeah. Program. People were able, you know, I worked very closely with, with Sammy, who's, who's kind of our HR person on, okay, what is our recruitment process going to look like? Okay, what is it that we, what kind of candidates are we going to look for? What kind of culture do we want to start building here at Lenbuzz? What is maybe like a, a cultural project that we can work on? Um, how are ways that we want to promote people, right? What does that look like? So it was actually really exciting for me to be part of that process because I felt very included. Um, and I felt like I actually could make a difference in the way that people were hired and retained um, just because at that, at that point I'd had it's funny, everybody I've had like every job you can think of. So, um, so I, I okay. kind of know, my, my CEO always says that he's like, yeah, Christina's had like every job, um, which is why I train on interviewing because I'm really good at it. So, um, so it was just really interesting for me and, and I felt very uh, valued you know, being able to have a say at the table and not just kind of walk into a company and somebody telling you, okay, this is the way that it is. And that's that, um, to going somewhere where they're like, okay, well, what do you think about the way that we do these things? Um, so I know for myself, working at a small startup just made me feel much more empowered in the company and into the direction that we were looking to head towards. And just ca caveat, LenBuzz is killing it and they have like 65 employees and I know they're doing super well. So they're obviously like, it worked out for them. So I'm really happy to, to hear that about them. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes total sense. I mean, if the, you know, one of the things that you talked about, which I, I think is interesting and important to this conversation is, you know, different phases of a company's growth are good for different people. And I think that's a really important thing to point out as well. It's like some of the employees that work really well with a six to 10 person team, maybe they're not going to be all that great at, um, you know, a 50 or a hundred person team. I know for myself, I'm not someone who's going to be very, you know, this is probably being recorded and maybe I'll go work for a fortune 500 company someday and <laughs> hopefully this doesn't get passed along, but I don't see myself working very well in a giant fortune 500 company. So, you know, one of the things that I try to do in my interview process is not only thinking about the candidate and their, their skill set, but thinking about, are they right for this phase of the organization? And Sometimes I'll even try to negatively sell the opportunity to make sure that this is something that they want and they know they want. So, you know, oftentimes we'll get sales candidates that are looking to come over from, you know, Oracle or some huge company. And I have to really, you know, do, I think my job in that interview process sometimes is to explain to them what this environment's going to be like and how it's going to be different. And I think for some people, small organizations without an HR team are 
perfect and they can thrive in those environments. And some people would really hate it. Um, so I find that one of the things that, that you have to do in the interview process, it's a two way interview and giving them the ability to understand um, whether or not it's the type environment that is appropriate for them is, is really important. Um, generally speaking for you guys, I mean, it might be hard to, to pinpoint, but share some thoughts on how much time you're spending in a given week on HR related tasks now as we speak. I can hop in. Not everybody at once. <laughs> <laughs> so I can hop in on that. Uh, I think that this is something that definitely changes. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about one of the mistakes that I actually made around hiring um, my first, uh, making my first hires in my company. So not necessarily as the Harvard HR professional, but more so when it was my my company and I had to make that hire of defining the job, just, you know, the, the job descriptions. So now I will say that for HR functions, it's a little bit less time because I've done the work up front. And so I have to say probably about maybe 10 hours right now per week myself on that um, because things are more defined. Um, the work will have to be done anyways, whether you do it proactively <laughs> or do it in the middle of a fire under pressure when you have to. Um, it's up to you, but the work will have to be done. The other thing that I do that is key, and again, Pooja, thank you so very much for bringing Sherm into the conversation, um, is I am consistently taking time uh, as an entrepreneur, as a startup, to make sure that I'm knowledgeable and up to date on current you know, practices and best practices as well. So just knowing that um, educating yourself is a part of that conversation as well. But right now, again, a little less time now because I had to do that work up front, um, not to be mistaken with the days where I had to be really kind of spending the most time on that, right? Tweaking those job descriptions, making sure that everything is, you know, in compliance and so forth. Um, so that varies. I'm happy to jump in. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Um, so for me, it's uh, the majority of my time now that we've moved remote, you know, a part of my role is also managing an office, which I no longer have. Um, I go in there like a couple times a month just to make sure that everything is working. Um, but other than that, the majority of my time is spent on, um, you know, the people operations function. And similar to what Afia said is uh, my work is proactive. I want to be proactively looking at how I can change the company. Um, make the changes we need to do right now. Something that I'm doing is actually choosing an ATS and applicant tracking system because that process has been very manual for us. And it was a huge chunk of my time. And when I tell you like onboarding takes two days, onboarding takes two days because we're do like, I'm doing it, not we, me. I am doing it manually. Um, and so being able to bring in, you know, an ATS and kind of take some of that work off of me so that I can focus on other things, um, you know, is, is really important. So that's, yeah, majority of my time is spent on that. We also have a diversity, equity, and inclusion team that I lead. So, um, you know, managing that. I also sit in on interviews um, and make sure that all like our recruiting is, we, we have been fortunate enough to still continue recruiting during the pandemic. So making sure that, you know, nobody is getting lost sort of in that flow of recruiting. Um, yeah, I, Proactively, I'm doing a lot, um, and it's a lot of fun. You know, it's it's building, and so it's challenging, um, but it's it's enjoyable to fill my time with things that are going to benefit my employees in the long run. That's great. I'm I'm going to jump. We, you know, we uh, didn't get to every question we wanted to get to because there was a great spirited conversation. I, there's one particular one that I wanted to wrap us up with here because um, I think it's so important, and we we touched a little bit on it earlier, and it, it's about management style. So, um, for you guys, is your management style you know, is it very KPI driven? Um, do people run their own schedules, which is sort of often thought of when people think of working in a startup? How rigid is your management? Like, what's the feedback loop? I think that's such an important, you know, we've, throughout this conversation, we've talked about recruiting and maintaining great talent and nurturing that talent. And I think this is a big part of it. Um, so, Afia, uh, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, talk about your management style. Sure. Um, so for me, I'd like to say that my management style is very unique, uh, but I don't put a lot of pressure on my team. So I know that in typical or maybe Fortune 500 companies is a very strict way of doing things. And then taking my experience from, again, working at Harvard or working for 
um, other organizations, the Urban League and Workforce Development, right? Um, and really thinking about what drives a team and what helps my team. So at the beginning of the week with my team, we set our goals and I let them know what the goal is and what we're trying to accomplish, what we're looking to accomplish. So you talk about KPIs, so key performance indicators, right? So definitely the goal, we have a, not a different goal, but we have goals um, that we're looking to push the company forward, right? So I let my team know what those goals are. I don't keep them to myself as a founder and as a CEO. I let them know, okay, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to get our, you know, increase our reach. I'd like to increase our marketing efforts. So this is what we're working on. So everybody's a part of the conversation. Um, I don't micromanage. It's something that I hated in corporate. I do. And so I was like, I needed, you know, it, was, it played a part uh, in my decision to become um, my own boss. Uh, and so I do not micromanage my team. I also want my team, I direct with them, but I also want them to have creative space to grow into their role and to be who they who they are within the role, because that brings another perspective for me as a founder and CEO. Um, so that's kind of my take pretty much on that. My management style is definitely direct. Um, I wouldn't say authoritarian, very direct, but also leaving an open, a, open availability for my team to be creative and feel like they can speak to me and say, hey, I have this new idea. What do you think about it? with all of us being on task with what the goal is for that week or for that month or for that quarter. That's great. So I actually, unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to stop us there and kick it back over to, uh, to start up Boston. Uh, that was a really full discussion. Uh, I'm sure we could have talked about that for a couple more hours, but I am going to have to cut us off. I just want to thank everybody on the panel. That was super, super helpful, even just for me uh, to, to hear some of those answers to those questions. So, I appreciate it. I'm going to kick it back over to you to, to wrap us up.